Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilder. I'm the Vice President of the Asia Center at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us today, um, but a special word of thanks to Ambassador Rao for taking the time to join us for this important and timely discussion. Uh, Ambassador Rao is one of India's foremost diplomats and foreign policy experts, having served as Foreign Secretary, Ambassador to China, and Ambassador to the United States. Uh, today she joins us to discuss India's foreign policy outlook during a time of rapid change uh, in the region. A border dispute with China turned deadly in June, uh, putting India's relationship with Beijing at a new low. Uh, the confrontation has raised concerns over what the world can expect from Asia's two major powers, uh, especially as geopolitical tensions rise. Intra-Afghan peace talks between negotiating teams from the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the Taliban began over the weekend, offering a glimmer of hope of peace in Afghanistan after 40 years of violent conflict. Uh, India's Minister of External Affairs addressed the talks and offered support. Uh, but India worries that a future political dispensation in Kabul with too much Taliban influence could hurt India and India's interests. India's relationships with its neighbors are also under some strain. Uh, in addition to the tensions with China already mentioned, there is of course the perennial Indo-Pak tech conflict uh, exacerbated by the situation in Kashmir. An amendment to India's citizenship law sparked protests in Bangladesh, uh, and a border dispute with Nepal has created friction in that relationship as well. Uh, meanwhile, the United States and its allies encourage India to play a more active role in the Indo-Pacific amid their own rising uh, tensions with China. All this takes place amid the coronavirus pandemic. With over 5 million cases, India has the second worst outbreak in the world and perhaps faces the most dire economic impact. How will India's foreign policy outlook adapt to the changing geopolitical order? Uh, these are some of the questions we will examine today with Ambassador Rao. Uh, after her opening remarks, my colleague Vikram Singh will moderate a discussion with her. Uh, we invite all of you to take part in that discussion during the question and answer time. You can ask a question by using the chat box function located just below the video screen on the USIP event page where you're watching today's event from. We ask that you please include your name and specify where you're joining us from in your questions. Uh, and you can also engage with us and each other on Twitter with today's hashtag Narupama Rao USIP. That's hashtag Narupama Rao USIP. Thank you again for joining us today and please join me in welcoming Ambassador Rao. Thank you, Vice President Wilder. It's a pleasure and a privilege to join all of you. I am speaking from Bangalore, and I believe uh, I, our discussions will be interesting. Uh, there is so much to talk about. I'm looking, really looking forward to the discussion. I was just reflecting on the title of our talk and uh, the webinar today. And you use the term inflection point, and I completely agree that we are at an inflection point in um, our foreign policy and as far as the situation in our neighborhood surrounding India is concerned. And why do we say that? First of all, of course, the COVID, the universe of COVID has upturned everything, everything that uh, all our calculations have been upturned. And uh, the situation has unforeseen ramifications for all of us, particularly in the region. And uh, talking about the larger environment that surrounds us, there's a kind of a geopolitical recession. I think that was a term that Ian Bremer used recently. Certainly there is a retrogression as far as the economy is concerned. So you have COVID and you have the economy and then you have China on our borders. So it's a kind of trifecta so many crossroads and so little sense of the road ahead. And unfortunately, this is no brave new world. Now, foreign policy for India is not isolated from any of these factors. Post COVID, what is the situation going to be, we ask. There is no rainbow, no pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. There is dysfunction, there is dystopia, there is chaos. 
you had the US-China confrontation, accentuated competition, confrontation. And then you had global economies taking years. They will take years to recover. You will see more nativism and more populism. You will see many poles vying for influence, many leagues of authoritarian gentlemen, and the weakening of multilateralism. Now, as far as India is concerned, where does that leave us? What is the primary goal of our foreign policy? Obviously, it is to make India strong and more resilient. Obviously, we will focus our energies on our neighborhood. We would like to ensure that diplomacy works to resolve outstanding problems involving our peace and security, ensuring that external balancing takes the pressure off threats to our sovereignty on our land borders. We would like to build more strength and substance and resilience into our Indo-Pacific policy. Our defense and security partnerships in the maritime domain, especially in the Indian Ocean, with the reinforcing of the geographical assets that we are naturally endowed with, and ultimately promoting the values of openness, transparency, with like-minded democracies, particularly with close partners like the United States, with, with whom we, we share a global comprehensive strategic partnership. Now, Vice President Wilder mentioned China. What really has happened as far as China is concerned? Who lost China? Maybe the answer is China lost China, really. Let me give you a little background of our relationship with China. Over the last three decades, we had built a structure. Uh, we called it a strategic cooperative partnership for peace and prosperity with China. It's, a, it's our largest neighbor. We share a land border of 3,500 kilometers, almost 3,500 kilometers with China. It's a troubled border. We have an unresolved boundary question between the two countries. Numerous efforts still ongoing uh, have existed. Uh, we've tried both sides to solve the question peacefully. We fought a brief war in 1962 in the fall of 1962, between October and November. We resumed diplomatic relations at the ambassadorial level in the mid 70s. From the early 80s onwards, we uh, endeavored once again uh, to put in place efforts to resolve the boundary issue in a fair and reasonable and mutually acceptable fashion. The visit of our prime minister, the then prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi to Beijing in the December of 1988, launched a period in our relationship, something like the Nixon opening to China, an opening to China where while we continued our efforts to resolve the boundary issue, we also built a structure and a process of relations in other spheres, particularly in the trade and economic sphere, and also in terms of cultural and educational linkages, even military to military ties, and of course, a high level political dialogue, which continued, which continued really up till, until October last year, when the second of the so-called informal summits between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping took place in the South Indian city of Chennai. But what we've seen with China under President Xi Jinping is a very muscular, assertive China. They say they're striving for achievement. They want to achieve a China dream, they want to see China's rejuvenation, but how it is translated into the rest of the region and for the rest of us is a new Chinese aggressiveness, uh, a policy of attrition as far as China's neighbors are concerned when it comes to territorial disputes. I not only refer to the maritime disputes in the East and South China Sea, but also on the land border with India. And simultaneously with that, the China-Pakistan relationship is also another thorn in the flesh for us in India. Uh, India is what, it was the first country to express its reservations and yes, its opposition to the Belt and Road Initiative with particular ref reference to the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which as you know, 
uh, a line through territory uh, under occupation of Pakistan in Kashmir, territory that is claimed by India. And along the line of actual control between India and China, particularly in the Union Territory, the Indian Union Territory of Ladakh, we've seen increased Chinese activity. We've seen uh, an upsetting of the status quo. We've seen Chinese transgressions in four to five pockets along the line of actual control and amassing of Chinese troops, men and material along the line of actual control. So the whole situation is very kinetic. And as you know, on the 15th of June, we had the incident at Galwan in Ladakh where the lives of 20 Indian army personnel were lost. And this was the first time that we had such a loss of life of such an extent since the uh, operations in the Natula Pass of Sikkim in 1967. And from uh, 1985 onwards, from October, sorry, October 1975 onwards, the border between the two countries had been quiet. Not a single shot had been fired in the border areas from October 1975. So a period, an interregnum of 45 years was finally ended with the bloodshed in Galvan. So that was a very serious inflection point, a turning point, almost a breaking point I would say. China has practiced a lot of ambiguity and ambivalence when it comes to defining the line of actual control between the two countries. And I refer particularly to the Western sector. As you know, there are four sectors of the India-China border, the Western sector, the middle sector, the Sikkim sector, and the Eastern sector. The problems that we face now are in the Western sector of the boundary. So this policy of attrition that China has practiced, literally stringing us along, uh, is worrisome and it has introduced great complications in the relationship and the impact of what happened in Galwan and what is happening today in the areas along the line of actual control in the border areas is having repercussions on all other aspects of the relationship. And you've seen it play out in the trade and economic sphere, particularly. And also, you know, public opinion in the country, in India, has turned completely against China as a result. And I'm sure you are aware of this uh, as far as other countries are concerned. And within the United States itself, I know there is basically an operational bipartisan consensus when it comes to China policy. And I think it really uh, reflects the concerns that we feel about the new China that is on the global stage today. So the rest of the world assesses China's actions really by and large. And if you look at most of the Asian countries around us, they feel China's attitude reflects an unmitigated belligerence on territorial issues, on the sovereignty issue. And uh, there is really no attempt to seek uh, painstaking, peaceful negotiations, diplomacy, in other words, to resolve these problems. So that is why the situation is so concerning and so serious, and which is why we're here to discuss it also today. Now, strategic autonomy is something that India pride its, prides itself about. But recent events concerning China have really seen an inevitable thrust in India towards greater closeness with the United States. We can, of course, discuss that in, in uh, the rest of the webinar. You have the Quad, of course, of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, which has been revived, which has been reincarnated, and hopefully will be increasingly rejuvenated as we go forward. But let's also remind ourselves that as far as India is concerned, the problem that we have with China, the sovereignty problem, the territorial integrity problem is basically a continental problem. It's a problem on our land borders. It's a problem along the high Himalayas. Our contest or our disputes with China, if you define them in the literal sense, are not in the maritime domain. But with Chinese assertiveness and the growth in Chinese military and naval power, the challenge to us is how we address the looming presence of China in our neighborhood. We've seen how China is so active 
among our smaller South Asian neighbors. No, I'm leaving Pakistan aside for the moment. Pakistan is the bigger problem. But even where the smaller South Asian countries are concerned, the Chinese presence is increasingly looming. Chinese trade and China's economic involvement in our region has grown phenomenally. And so the challenge is not only how to calibrate our neighborhood policy, but also how we marshal and husband our defense and security assets in order to create, for instance, better maritime domain awareness, including underwater surveillance, interoperability with our defense and security partners, all the ramifications of what the Quad can be and should be and whether we can also expand the definition of the Quad to cover areas of technology, infrastructure, uh, humanitarian assistance, and uh, dealing with disasters, and how India is to better safeguard its geographical assets in the Southern Indian, in Indian Ocean, around the coastline of India. What are the economic measures that we have to take to deal uh, with the crisis vis-a-vis -vis China? Uh, how do we build, build and buttress what the Prime Minister has called self-reliance, Atma Nirbharta? How are we to better safeguard our interests? And how are we to create strategic alignments with our friends and partners in order to safeguard these economic interests because they equally impinge on national security today? And how did all this come about? Did our policy towards China over the last few years did we calibrate it well enough? Did we see all that was coming? Uh, did we, were we not cognizant of the risks, the existential risks involved in our China policy? Did the structure of relations that we built with China since, since 1988 serve us? So this is all together truly an inflection point in the relationship. I'll stop here because I know that Vikram has a lot of questions prepared for me to answer. And I look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Vikram. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Rao. And what a pleasure to have you. It's been far too long. Um, we were last uh, saw each other in January last year in Bangalore. And uh, it, uh, it, I look forward to the time that we could do something like this together again. We're really grateful for you uh, joining us. Um, you know, I want to start with what's been the thrust of your discussion. I, it is a new, it is a new reality between India and China. And the, the relevance of that for the world is, is significant. This is the, both the two largest countries on earth, uh, both nuclear powers, uh, sitting with the dispute here and, um, really, uh, impacting the entire future of the, of the region, depending on how they are able to manage, um, these tensions. I thought I would ask you to make some personal uh, reflections. You just ended asking, were we, did we manage it correctly? Did we make, did we, you know, where, how did we it get uh, to this point? And I think many countries feel like China has been stringing them along, uh, as, as you said, and sort of, um, yeah, waging a, a war of attrition when it comes to these uh, territorial disputes and trying to just steadily gain the advantage. Now, you are one of the most experienced India hands when it comes to dealing with China. You are working on a book on India, Chinese diplomatic history um, from the period uh, around the around the war, after the post-war period, and uh, up to the up to the India Sino-Indian War. Um, and of course, you served as ambassador in Beijing. And we've recently seen sort of this highly assertive wolf warrior diplomacy from. Uh, from uh, Chinese colleagues, right? Many of whom many of us have dealt with over the years. And now we've seen them sort of out there with this really aggressive uh, stance backed up by really what feel like aggressive moves on the ground. Can you give us some reflections on your experience interacting with, Chi the, with your Chinese counterparts over the years and managing these issues and how you see uh, things having changed um, between a time of building a constructive partnership to now what seems like managing a crisis. Thank you, Vikram. Um, well, I um, would like to start uh, at the beginning. I mean, I'm talking of 1988 when we began with the prime ministerial visit to China that 
extraordinary leap of faith that India took in making that visit at a time when we had similar tensions along the border as we see today. We had a Chinese intrusion in the eastern sector in Arunachal Pradesh in the area we call Sundarong Chu and tensions were running high, but this was of course before social media, before the new, new uh, you know, communications revolution that has completely overwhelmed most of us. So we were able to contain and manage that dispute, I think, in a, in a more uh, in, in a more successful way, let's say, in retrospect. And of course, the visit that Mr. Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, undertook to China resulted in that breakthrough, that decision on both sides to build the structure of relations that essentially was an operating system that uh, was valid until, let's say, till Galwan happened, although it was beginning to fray at the edges. Because what we saw, when we started out in 1988, essentially our GDPs were at the same level, you know, the per capita income was more or less at the same level, our levels of development were, were almost matched. And then you saw China, you know, make these enormous strides and their system, I suppose, is so different from India's, the way they were able to manage the pace and dictate the pace of change was, you know, it, it was very different from what we in democratic in India uh, do and, and the way we do our, you know, our development and the way we administer our policies. So comparisons are odious. I don't want to make them. But the fact is that China did make you know, great progress. Its GDP grew five times over India's. Its military budget grew phenomenally. And um, it became the leading trading nation in the world. You know, its presence on the global stage just multiplied uh, in terms of proportion and presence so phenomenally. And with that, I think, came a lot of hubris, a lot of assertiveness, a lot of aggressive nationalism, and compounded, I think, now by, you know, the leadership of Xi Jinping, uh, which is all about striving for achievement, which is all about rejuvenation. And uh, they move with a great sense of grievance. It's as if the rest of the world has denied China its place in the world, which is not really the case, you know, I think, for instance, take the United States and with the opening of president, with the opening that President Nixon was able to achieve towards China, China really got many, many senses, a first class ticket ride, I think it really got a ticket to ride. Many countries don't have that ticket to ride, but China did get that ticket to ride and, and it, and it, uh, you know, built its strength on that basis and, and uh, power and influence all around as we see today. So over the years, what we saw was that not only did China seem much less reasonable about settling disputes and about negotiating settlements, it began to be much more strident about um, asserting its claims. It was, so, it was so much more biased and so much more irresponsible about about how it looked at South Asia, especially at Pakistan. You saw the way that it seemed to support Pakistan irrationally when it came to the listing of Masood Azhar, for instance, and how long it took for that listing to take place under the UN Sanctions Committee because China was the holdout. And um, when it came to, you know, one would have expected China to, to exert far more uh, rational influence on Pakistan in order to, to restrain it from being the kind of uh, cross-border terrorism supporting country that it has been vis-a-vis -vis India. So China did not act in consonance with and in proportion to the power and influence that it could have exerted all across our region. So in that sense, it has been a supporter of authoritarian governments. It has not been transparent about the administering of its development projects under the BRI. Smaller countries have just run up so much debt vis-a-vis -vis China. They've had to sacrifice sovereignty in some cases as Sri Lanka did have to do vis-a-vis -vis Hambantota when it had to uh, allow China a 99 year lease of the port. So all these are disquieting uh, signs of China's activities in the region, very different from the kind of self-image 
that it has of itself. As far as China is concerned, the concept of original sin doesn't apply to it, even when it comes to how it describes the situation along the line of actual control with India. They're always talking about the rights and wrongs and how you know the blame has to be attributed to, to India, which, I, which is so difficult for us to accept and for the rest of the world also to believe. I think the way, you know, the, the tide of public opinion, global opinion mm -hmm. has moved in favor of India. You compare it with 1962 and now, I think the balance of opinion across the world favors India on this issue. And I think it has a lot to do with China's attitude and the way it is perceived to be following this assertiveness and this muscular nationalism and this kind of uh, patriotic zealotry <laughs> that you see uh, uh, written all across the face of China today, which doesn't bode well, I believe, for peace in our region. Yeah, uh, it's absolutely uh, true. When you, it's very stark when you, when you, when you lay it all out uh, that way, you realize that I, part of the Chinese attitude seems to be that there's not much that the world can do about it, even as it bands together to object, that they don't expect there to be uh, much that can be done to, to, to stop their pushes all around their periphery um, into, their, into, the dis, into disputed territories. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how the deepening China-Pakistan partnership, particularly CPEC, which you mentioned before, but also this, the, the question of you know, where China would be vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan in terms of any kind of military confrontation or any crisis that, are, that would arise. Um, where that, how, what, what is the dilemma that presents to India of the deep, that deepening Chinese-Pakistan partnership? And, and particularly, how do Indian strategists view the situation of having essentially a hot, potentially a hot conflict on both sides uh, up in the, in the far north of the country with tensions with China and the potential for uh, flare-ups in, in uh, uh, line of control uh, tensions with uh, Pakistan? Well, I think the, the first point I'd, I'd like to make is that our relationship with Pakistan, of course, is fraught with a lot of complexity. And, uh, you know, that underlying tension in the relationship is always there. And, you know, uh, from our point of view, and we've said it out clear and very, very uh, uh, vocally, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, that we are confronted with a situation where a neighboring country of ours, Pakistan, has, has uh, consciously pursued a policy of fomenting terrorist activity across the line of control in Kashmir, as also along the border with India. And uh, this situation has festered for 70 long years. It's not as if we didn't try to mend fences with Pakistan. Numerous such attempts have been made in the past and have come to naught because every time, and including with Prime Minister Modi, you know, uh, when he was inaugurated in 2014, he invited all the South Asian heads of state uh, or heads of government to come uh, to the ceremony, including Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, then Prime Minister of Pakistan. And then uh, again, he visited Prime Minister Sharif in Pakistan, as you know, uh, the, a year later. And then it was followed with the attacks on the Pat Patan Court Air Base. And then, you know, there's been a steady, steady descent, therefore, into more and more tension. And uh, the situation has just not been able to mend itself because of the fact that India has just not, I mean, whatever we have done in terms of pursuing a policy of peace and negotiation with Pakistan, it's come to naught because it hasn't been reciproc reciprocated adequately, sufficiently, reasonably from the Pakistan side. So that's where the relationship with Pakistan rests at the moment, if you can use the word rest. And then you have China. China is the second point. The China is a close friend, an ally, an iron brother of Pakistan. And you wonder why China has such few friends. It's few, the, the friends it has 
I mean, its only friend perhaps is Pakistan. Even North Korea, I think, is somewhat ambivalent when it comes to China today. So China has very few friends and China has to really do some soul searching as far as that is concerned. What are China's foreign policy successes? I mean, it has used its deep pockets, no doubt, to build infrastructure. The BRI is its own, uh, you know, uh, attempt to articulate Chinese power and influence across the world. And therefore, with Pakistan today, it, the China-Pakistan economic corridor builds China even more of that influence, more of that control. Uh, it needs Pakistan, obviously, to, uh, it needs that, con that controlling factor as far as Pakistan is concerned, because it is obviously looking at the situation in its own Xinjiang province and the way it has treated Uyghurs and it wants to make sure that there's no cross-border problems created by Pakistan. It wants to reach out to the Arabian Sea, so therefore the port of Gwadar. So China is obviously pursuing its own self-interest and also able to control the Pakistani mind space through you know, the economic and military and security influence that it brings to bear on, on Pakistan. Now, does that all translate into uh, further complications as far as our border areas are concerned? That was your question. Now, as far as the front with China is concerned, the front in Ladakh, now, it's true that after the abrogation of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution last, last year, in August last year, the Chinese reacted quite adversely to the Indian government's decision to create two union territories, one of Jammu and Kashmir and the other of Ladakh. And uh, I don't want to go into those details, but there was a clear attempt by China after that not only to uh, speak very stridently against this move, but also in fact, to take it to the UN Security Council in, in an attempt to internationalize the dispute. So, you know, China's, um, uh, you know, credentials, let us say, as a, as a balanced uh, observer and as a balanced um, neighbor when it came to the disputes between India and Pakistan was that image was completely shattered, I think, by those events post August 2019. So today, when you talk of the kinetic situation along the line of actual control, the first question that comes to mind of many observers is that in the event, God forbid, of a conflagration of a conflict breaking out, uh, what I mean, will the Pakistanis be up to mischief? And what is the China, what is going to be the Chinese government's attitude on that? Well, I, I think uh, you know our imagination may be running a little too far ahead as far as that is concerned. I think India has been making conscious efforts, and the Chinese too. We've been talking about disengagement. We've been talking of de-escalation in the areas along the line of actual control. I don't believe the intention is to enter into conflict on these issues because we have had China and India and China over the last 30 years. We did build a kind of a, you know, undergirding of this relationship that did have mechanisms for building confidence, for promoting peace and tranquility, the military to military level contacts, the political level dialogue. So I think there is a certain, at least some element of resilience in this relationship. And that I hope will stand us in some good stead as we move forward so that the Pakistanis don't make mischief. I mean, they continue, I mean, there are, they continue to be ceasefire violations along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir with Pakistan. They continue to try and push militants across the border. There's no doubt about that. We have to be, you know, eternal vigilance, as they say, is the price of liberty, as it were. So that eternal vigilance cannot be relaxed as far as Pakistan is concerned. But I'm quite confident that there's not going to be a two front sort of um, exploding of tensions uh, at this point of time, because efforts are ongoing with China to try and reduce these tensions that we have with that country, with China. And the two ministers, the foreign ministers met, as you know, in Moscow a few uh, days ago, last week. And, uh, you know, they've resolved, both sides have resolved to, to infuse further confidence building into the process and to see how we can diffuse tensions and make sure that uh, the winter months, you know, don't see a further buildup, a further escalation of tensions. The situation is, continues to be tense, but I believe, 
you know, we will, I think we should be able to hold this in the way it is at the moment and uh, there should be no further deterioration. It seems like the, it seems like the um, agreement or statement between uh, uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was, uh, was intended to sort of uh, freeze things. It didn't really necessarily give a path to a way down, but it reaffirmed the various mechanisms that the two countries have for managing their tensions and committed to using those to, to find a way forward. So, but I think it, you know, maybe it leads to sort of a plateau of tensions that stay much higher than they used to be. So that baseline obviously means increased risk of, of flare ups. Um, I could go down this road for a, a long time, but I wanted to turn to the rest of the neighborhood also. So, um, you know, the, and, and I have questions questions and in some cases they echo where I was going anyway so I'm gonna I'm gonna start weaving some of those into the conversation so um, you know my next uh, thought was to ask you uh, sort of about the you know Modi administration came in with a neighborhood first policy and as Andrew mentioned in our introduction uh, a lot of things uh, there have been there have been little incidents where it seemed like there's some smaller troubles in neighborhood ties. So a border dispute with Nepal that seemed a little unexpected. Tons of progress with Bangladesh, including the resolution of all outstanding territorial disputes with Bangladesh, but then kind of upset when the CIA came in and it looked to the Bangladesh like a whole bunch of people might be pushed over the border back into Bangladesh, uh, which is something they are uh, obviously concerned and sensitive to. Uh, the return of the Rajapaksas in Sri Lanka, who brought, uh, who, who actually engaged in that sort of uh, loving with love, love fest with China that resulted in the whole Hamantota debacle, and whether they would uh, turn back to Beijing in a way that was detrimental to India's interests. Um, so one of the questions from the audience was also, how would you assess the neighborhood first policy and what do you think India uh, should do as it looks forward and as the neighbors look with concern I'm sure at India-China tensions and wonder what that means for how they manage relations with these two giant uh, neighbors. Well, it's true that, you know, the primary focus of our foreign policy has to be our neighborhood. And uh, despite the fact that you have seen uh, the rise of China in our neighborhood and literally China crossing the Himalayas into South Asia, as it were, and also in Sri Lanka, you, you've seen an increased presence in the Maldives, for instance, in Afghanistan. The fact is that, uh, you know, the approach that India is increasingly beginning to take as far as its neighborhood first policy is concerned. And you've seen that just the other day, just a few days ago, the United States and the Maldives signed a defense agreement. Uh, you're aware of that, a defense cooperation agreement. Now, and in the old days, you would have seen the Indian attitude to that. You know, we don't want anybody in our backyard. <laughs> Even the use of the term backyard seems to be, I think, rather not the best, best term to use. But anyway, we would have reacted quite adversely or in a kind of a, you know, Pavlovian fashion to uh, to that uh, happening. But India was was quite all right uh, with that uh, with that uh, development. And the United States and India had consulted with each other apparently before that. And uh, so, you know, there is this new approach. And I think it's a mature, it's a wise, it's a well considered approach, where India is willing to work with friendly powers for instance, the United States, when it comes to um, the policy outlook towards the region, whether it, when it comes to development, when you talk of an Asia-Africa growth corridor, whether it's working with Japan or in Colombo port, for instance, you know, now this defense cooperation agreement, I noticed that and that uh, the uh, United States Defense Secretary, Ms. Esper, and uh, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa have just had a telephone conversation, again, perhaps about defense uh, uh, cooperation. These are areas where India and the United States and other friendly countries can collaborate. And if it is, uh, in a sense, it, it uh, is reassuring to our neighbors, 
well, we want, we would like to work in their interest also. India, I mean, our foreign minister has spoke to, has spoken about, you know, the balance, the equilibrium that we want to create. And that, you know, we want more connectivity. We want more infrastructure to be uh, able to integrate this region. This region was integrated at one point 70 years ago. And somehow over the decades that those ties have, in a sense, weakened, have frayed, and we need to build them again. And why not work with friendly powers to do that? That really is the approach now. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because uh, South Asia, by the numbers, is the least integrated sort of sub-region, uh, possibly in the world. Um, it is, uh, and it's. There's a lot of there's a lot of potential for building those ties, and that might that might help address uh, a, a whole number of concerns. Um, the the uh, the the next sort of circle. This all circles back to China, I think. But the next the next area I really wanted to get your thoughts on was that this notion of the Indo Pacific and India and the United States. Uh, partnering in support of what is, you know, being always being termed the free and open Indo-Pacific and a rules-based order. My question is, do we mean the same things when we talk about free and open and rules-based orders? Have we defined what a rules-based order looks like in the 21st century for this region? I think there's a lot of value in thinking of the Indo-Pacific as an integrated as an integrated area um, where countries with similar values and priorities can, can cooperate. And that's where the quad seems to be playing an increasingly active role. But what is it, what do we, where, where are we in terms of really having a similar strategic vision? And obviously there's going to be differences in our, in our priorities, even if we're cooperating. So could you just address India's thinking about the Indo-Pacific and its sort of increasing both look east policy and increasing activities with all of these great powers in the region. Well, I let me see. I think I'm muted. Am I muted? No, you're good. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Well, our the policy uh, of regarding the free and open India uh, Indo Pacific is concerned. I think our views and those. I mean, when the United States speaks about a free and open Indo Pacific, and when you speak of a rule based international order, when you speak about freedom of navigation, when you speak about codes of conduct, when you speak of a peaceful resolution of territorial disputes. I think we're both on the same page. We're on the same side of history, as it were, India and the United States, when it comes to the outlook that we have. It may be so that as far as your strategic competition with China is concerned, and uh, and your traditional focus on the Western Pacific and East Asia, there, we, are, we, you know, we are in a different part of the region. And we are, our views are conditioned by a lot of what happens in our neighborhood. We have our long land border with China. We have disputes to settle in that regard. But there is this need also for that balancing that is required if we have to create that deterrent to Chinese aggression or Chinese assertiveness or you know this new overzealous nationalism that we see and that's again a play uh, an area where we need to work with like-minded friendly powers just as i said in our neighborhood i just spoke in my previous answer about the way we need to work with friendly powers in our neighborhood and that's where the quad comes in for instance the Quad is still, I think, a work in progress. It's still defining the parameters of its functioning. It's still to define, it's still, you know, perfecting or let's say finessing its agenda. But, you know, we have made a beginning. The ministers are talking. Uh, we are talking about this rule-based international order. Uh, all of us, the four countries in Quad, see, you know, the complexities in dealing with China and how we we have to understand, we are, I think, developing a shared understanding. It may not exactly be a common understanding because there will be areas of emphasis and de-emphasis when it, based on our own situations, our own, you know, the complexities that we face regarding China, the emphasis that we want to give to some areas over the others. But overall, I believe we share a certain approach 
founded on shared democratic values and, uh, and principles also, and the need to create an order in this region that is reassuring for the rest of the region also. You know, we are not talking of a, a G0 situation where you don't have any power that counts in the region. We're not talking of strict bipolarity also just between China and the United States. There are a lot of middle powers in the region, including India, that create their own poles of interest and influence. So it is this situation of, of um, a plurilateral situation, let, let us call it, or a multipolar situation, where I believe this concert of so many poles, so much multipolarity in the region, creates that room for maneuver vis-a-vis -vis China. But also through this process, safeguards our security and doesn't you know, allow uh, a situation to develop where China's uh, you know, flouting of the rules and its willful ignoring of you know, international law doesn't create complications for our future and for our peaceful development, something that China is constantly stressing, but seems to be constantly flouting also. You know, in Southeast Asia, I think uh, there's a lot of potential for India to engage with ASEAN partners on how they're perceiving these similar, these similar dynamic. That the stringing along you discussed, when you think of the code of conduct negotiations, uh, between ASEAN member states and, and China, I think there's a sense among most of the ASEAN partners that China is just just stre stretching things out and having talks that will lead to a meaningless a meaningless agreement. Is I there think a where, the, where the ASEAN countries are concerned, I think you know there are levels of trust and mistrust of China. I think nobody, of course, is perhaps speaking it, uh, saying it out loud. Maybe some perhaps say it more than the others. Uh, you know, for instance, Vietnam is a little more outspoken. Uh, but the, I think the levels of trust of China, and there's this trust factor in the Indo-Pacific, I think, which is increasingly diminishing when it comes to China. And that includes the ASEAN countries also, countries that have traditionally, I think, tended to perhaps take a more neutral, more middle of the road approach when it comes to China. But even that seems to be, seems to be a metamorphosizing now into something that signifies much lower levels of trust when it comes to China. And is there a way that India can um, sort of uh, take, in, in a strategic sense, uh, sort of uh, take advantage of that increasing common distrust in its engagement with ASEAN, with countries like Vietnam or Malaysia or Indonesia? Definitely, definitely. I think not only in the maritime domain, not only when it comes to defense and security, but also in terms of, uh, of you know, this is a region with which India traditionally, historically had the closest of relations. I mean, we have common histories, uh, so many ethnic, so many linguistic, so many cultural ties. Don't forget this entire South Indian Ocean and you know the Malacca Straits. This was an open sea, and this is really what you need to restore today. You know, this was an area where merchants, you know, transacted their trade and business and built this whole uh, concept of what we know as Indochina. You know, where India and China literally met. But today, unfortunately you know, instead of having this uh, confluence, as it were, of civilizations that traditionally this history was built on, uh, you see more and more of a, of a clash or more and more perhaps a, 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 a kind of a tension developing within this, what was once a common geographical, cultural, economic space. That's very interesting because it's such a different historic perception than what the Chinese put forward because the Chinese basically put forward most of this was a Chinese lake rather than the just said of an open... Of Look at the Kailash line, for instance. I mean, it's yeah. all or nothing. There's no scope for give and take, no scope for compromise, no scope for mutually acceptable settlements, which is what makes the Chinese attitude so concerning. Well, uh, one of the questions from the audience was around COVID, not sort of, uh, not just impact on India, 
And to a degree, I do think China is seeing this as a, a moment of weakness for India because the economic of impact of COVID will be so severe that it can press its advantage. But, but um, do you see India uh, being able to use the COVID crisis as a way to build cooperation with, with the neighborhood, with, you know, especially with its immediate neighbors and even potentially with Pakistan, where health could be something that is sort of held aside from the other kinds of concerns? Well, I personally think there should be no political barriers when it comes to health and when it comes to public health policy. And it, because you know, the welfare of, you know, over a billion people in our region depends on it. I'm not just talking of India alone, but also of our, of our neighbors and our prime minister, as you know, uh, just before, you know, the pandemic really hit us. But at the at the outset, we had this meeting of this of the SARC leaders, as you know, right. this kind of, uh, you know, this this um, this discussion that the prime minister chaired to talk about how we could use uh, cooperation within the region to deal with the pandemic. So I think, and at the scientific level, I believe that cooperation continues, must continue, because, uh, you know, we are all in this together, really. There are no geographical or cartographic or political divisions when it comes to this. But And then uh, India's own, um, you know, it's now chairing the World Health Assembly. It's now, you know, in a position where I think it can offer its uh, not only good offices, but also the, the solid expertise that our own scientific establishment can bring to bear on the crafting of of a, of a global approach uh, to meet the challenge of the pandemic. It's an ongoing thing. I mean, you're working, for instance, on vaccine development. India is very much a part of the international, uh, the concert of uh, countries that is working together to develop uh, the set of COVID vaccines, for instance. India, in, in many ways, because of its pharmaceutical strengths, is very well equipped. Look at the assistance that we've extended to over 100 countries when it comes to uh, therapeutic drugs to deal with COVID, including to the United States, uh, you know, as far as hydroxychloroquine uh, was concerned, hyd hydroxychloroquine was concerned, and uh, in many of the antiviral drugs. Uh, so, you know, India's ability to be uh, of uh, concrete assistance is well recognized. But you know, what concerns me again, I'm sorry to bring this back to, to China. Uh, the fact is that the virus did originate in China. You know, I'm not going to give it any names. This, we're not here to, to name the virus in one way or the other, but the fact is COVID-19 is believed from all accounts to have originated in China. And those first few crucial weeks when the, the, uh, the disease, the viral outbreak could have been contained better if so many people had not traveled out of Wuhan, if there was not so much of an attempt to cover it up and to, and to chastise and to uh, take action against those Chinese, brave Chinese who spoke out about it, especially those doctors like Li Wenliang and others who spoke out against the, uh, against the fact, or not spoke out against, but tried to throw light on this new virus. I wish, you know, uh, though that period could have been handled better by the Chinese government. After all, China is a global power. It seeks superpower stages. But was its handling of those first few weeks? China has to examine its own conscience on that, I think. However much it may have handled the pandemic or the, or the virus later. So uh, this is also a question that's very troubling, I think, for the world. But I think in the long run, this should be an opportunity, COVID and the fight against it, to strengthen multilateral institutions. And that's a message to the United States also. I think it's yeah. very essential that the United States should be a leading champion for multilateralism, particularly multilateral cooperation, to deal with threats to human security of this nature, like diseases, global pandemics of this nature. You know, I don't mind that you brought it back to China because one one question was so the um, one of the big changes we've seen and the the handling of COVID was I think a, a part of the driver towards this is a a big shift to try to contain China's technological ambitions and India is now sort of the forefront because India has banned Chinese apps. It is banning and rest or restricting Chinese investment in strategic sectors. I I cannot imagine at this point that 
Chinese 5G technology would become a part of India's 5G um, push. And even in Europe and obviously from the United States um, and in Australia and other places, you're seeing a, a big shift from just six or eight months ago when most countries were saying we can manage and we'll have Chinese and other technologies. There's a big push to, to sort of uh, contain that part of China's global ambition. Uh, do you see India wanting to play a, a leadership role in those sorts of realms, technological norms, cyber norms, and that cybersecurity? Or, or is India much more focused? Is it much more just an internal issue for India? No, it's not just an internal issue, of course, uh, you know, national security and the and the safeguarding of critical infrastructure, national infrastructure, telecommunications being one of them is obviously essential. We have to take necessary steps to ensure that our security is not diluted in any way. And that's where the China factor comes in. And you've seen the steps that we've, we've, uh, we are taking, for instance, on the 5G question, I don't believe Huawei will be involved at all in the, in the, in the uh, you know, introduction of 5G technology into India. But this raises another issue, the whole question of technology in a 21st century universe involving our interaction with the outside world. And this is where strategic partnerships come in, you know, technology being very much a part of all these strategic partnerships. When it comes to our partnership with the United States, with countries like Germany and France, with Japan, with Australia. You know, when you talk of the Quad, when you, you know, Quad, you talk of the Malabar exercises, you talk of, you know, defense and security related cooperation, but there are these aspects also to the, to the, to the partnerships that we build up because how are we going to deal with a situation where the world is splintering re really into these blocks? In the Chinese are building their own technology uh, as far as these telecommunication aspects are concerned. The Russians are trying to build their own internet, as it were. Uh, but you know, we, the democracies, the you know, this uh, this alliance literally of liberty that we need to build up with like-minded countries that should safeguard. Tech, our critical technologies for the future, technologies on which our development is so uh, critically dependent on, uh, technologies where it is so easy for our adversaries to create uh, severe crises uh, in our ongoing, you know, efforts to become stronger and uh, and and more developed. I think. These are all areas where we will have to think very, very strategically in order to build partnerships where we can develop technologies in an atmosphere of complete trust and confidence. And that really should become one of the new architectures really for, for the future. Well, we're running very close to the end of time. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to throw three questions from the audience at you together and you can answer any assortment of them that you want, but um, they are, and we'll, we'll get to the end of our time with that. Um, uh, the first was, uh, did you, do you expect India, would India be at all look to uh, involvement by outside parties or help from third parties in its disputes? For example, Sino-Indian, Indo-Pakistan, something India has never really wanted in the past. Um, that was, that's question one. Question two is, um, how do you see U.S.-India defense co cooperation and deals affecting the balance of power between China and India? Is it, in, is it sort of enough to help India be on par with China, given China's military developments? And the third um, is on Afghanistan. Um, when, with the start of negotiations, most observers think a regional framework that supports any future uh, outcome is, is critical. And it won't work unless the region agrees. And what do you see, what is the Indian viewpoint on what kind of regional framework might be able to sustain an Afghan peace should that come? So those are three questions. We have three minutes, so uh, you can take all or one or none, Eddie, up to you. Well, where the first question is concerned, and you're talking of, um, you know, uh, 
third party involvement or for mediation in as far as India's bilateral disputes are concerned, let's say with Pakistan or with China. I don't uh, foresee a scenario in which you will have active third party involvement when it comes to the resolution of these disputes and differences. I think the focus and the preference and the approach that India takes will be bilateral. Uh, it is true, of course, that there will be, like for instance, now concerning the situation with China, whenever we've had problems with China, take the 1962 conflict, for instance, the United States was the first country really that, that uh, came to our assistance in terms of you know, sustaining and supporting uh, the Indian military at that point of time in 1962. And even today, I believe the kind of intelligence sharing that goes on, the kind of um, very vocal expressions of support that we have received from the Trump administration and the defense and security partnerships that we've built, I think go, they speak volumes about, you know, the kind of um, the kind of support that India is receiving and the kind of, uh, you know, endorsement of India's policies that we, we, we receive from countries like the United States. But then when it comes to disputes, I pres presume, you know, for instance, with China, we will have to face up to China ourselves. Secondly, about, I think the second, the second question was, uh, forgive the me. The defense what, deals, U.S.-India defense deals, does it affect Meaningfully, well, I think the defense and security partnership, as I just mentioned with the United States, is extremely important and it has grown in dimension, strength and substance over the last decade, decade and a half, you know. So the United States is an extremely crucially and very important defense and security partner for the United States. To what extent does it balance the threat from China, if that was the question? I think the Chinese, by virtue of the fact that the Chinese themselves being thin-skinned as they are, show themselves to be so worried and concerned about the extent of our partnership with the United States itself is evidence of, of, uh, of this uh, creating a new balance in the region, let us say. A balance that certainly deters, uh, creates a deterrence against China, in my view. And the third thing about Afghanistan, I think for peace, real peace, uh, to return to Afghanistan for the civil war to end and for the, the, the fruits of development that we've seen in Afghanistan over the last 20 years to be sustained, there will have to be regional cooperation. There will have to be a consolidation of like-minded uh, countries with the right attitude on this. And Pakistan, unfortunately, is a standout because it, it doesn't want India to be involved in, in such initiatives as far as you know, bringing stability to Afghanistan is concerned. India has interests in Afghanistan. India's, it, when we're on the side of the Afghan people, we're not on the side of the Taliban, no doubt, but we're on the side of the Afghan people and we want the Afghan people to get the peace they deserve. We want the projects, the development activities that we pursued in Afghanistan, $3 billion worth of assistance that we gave Afghanistan over the last two decades. We want all that to continue. We don't want to, you know, uh, cut those links with Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a neighbor. It's a part of South Asia. We share so much in common with the Afghan people. But for that, we need collaboration. We need the Pakistanis to be much more rational, much. And that is where, you know, countries like China, China, you know, says it has the closest of relations with Pakistan, but it has not acted responsibly, I believe, in terms of bringing influence to bear. You talked about, you know, can any third party, you know, create a, a situation where peace can be restored between India and Pakistan. Well, China is not able to advise Pakistan, I believe, or, if, or at least doesn't bring to bear its influence to, on Pakistan in order for it to take a more reasoned, more rational, more peace-oriented attitude, whether it comes to India or whether it comes to Afghanistan. But I think the Russians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis, the Iranians, that is after the United States withdraws from the region and India, I think we need, we should be able to work together for the good of the Afghan people. To what extent the Taliban will play ball, that really is the, is the question. You know, they don't, haven't inspired much confidence. 
Well, this is uh, let's let's certainly hope for that. I think that's a that's a that's a very hopeful note to end on. The region trying to come together to support the Afghan people who have suffered who have suffered so much. We've hardly touched on issues I would have loved to get to Russia, uh, Iran, any others. Um, but before I let you go, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to mention one of your projects that I think is quite amazing, which is the South Asia Orchestra. And I know we've gone a little over, but could you just share with our audience a little bit about what you've been doing uh, in terms of building bridges? Because you have always been a bridge builder and someone who believes in the power of people to sort of transcend differences and make a better future. So if you could just share a little bit on that and then we'll then we'll sign off. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, that was really nice of you to raise that. Now, the South Asian Symphony Orchestra, uh, I created it. It was really inspired by the East Western Divan Orchestra that the Israelis and Palestinians have, and which was created by uh, Edward Said and Daniel Baron Boyd. So when I looked at South Asia and I looked, I mean, the eight nations of South Asia from Afghanistan, uh, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, all of us together. There's such a lack of uh, communication at the popular level, I felt, between all of us. And why not use music? And music is something I've always loved. I use it as a medium to bring young people of the region together. So I and my husband and I, we established a foundation in Bangalore called the South Asian Symphony Foundation two years ago. And over the last two years, we have created a whole database of musicians from the countries of the region that together constitute the South Asian Symphony Orchestra, which we call Chirag, which is a in the study word, which means lamp, a lamp that illuminates the darkness around us. So we've had two concerts, full-fledged orchestral concerts of Chirag in Mumbai and Bangalore in 2019. And uh, the idea is to use music to make peace notes, as we call it, peace notes that bring uh, the all these countries together, inspired by the spirit of uh, leaders like Mahatma Gandhi, I think, who means a lot to the whole region, whose memory is still revered around the world. And uh, so that really is the South Asian Symphony Orchestra, which makes peace notes in a region where we don't see too much peace and we see very little communication. We're trying to teach or at least help South Asians cultivate the art of listening to each other, communicating with each other, and uh, overcoming stereotypes and prejudices. It's a beautiful vision. It's a hopeful vision. I've always enjoyed both diplomacy and music with you and your family. And it is, uh, it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a terrific thing to see. People can, you can Google it, you can learn more about it. You will find uh, poetry, you will find even uh, albums recorded by Ambassador Rao. So you, uh, you, there, there are many more facets here. Uh, we're so grateful to you for joining us uh, today. This has been a terrific session. Thank you to our audience members for being a part of it. Uh, sorry, I let the, the go a few minutes over and thank you for being generous with your time. And let's hope to do this in person very soon. Thank you so much, Vikram. And thank you to uh, Vice President Wilder and to all of you at the USIP. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador.